I don't know who needs to hear this today, but there's no such thing as good music and bad music. It's just the music that feels right for you. There's no such thing as good technique and bad technique. Just the technique that works for you. There's no less is more or more is more. It's just the amount that feels right for you. You can literally make anything you want. Every rule is arbitrary. Nothing and nobody is pure. And you don't need to be an expert at something to contribute something of value. Just build yourself a language of the stuff that is important to you. Pull shamelessly from every school of thought and absorb as much as you can. Open your heart and say who you are. So in this tweet, Crypto says, the funny thing is he has been trained. He has talent and he knows the difference between quality and garbage singing. How does he know? He demonstrates it every time he sings and plays well using proper forms and techniques. He is his own contradiction to his own argument. Kruptos is wrong in this instance, and Jacob Collier is right. Jacob Collier has bad taste, which, um, that's what I said. I did a video about him a long time ago in his crazy cover of Moon River and all the people that covered his cover of Moon River in crazy ways. Uh, it's like my one of my only videos that's copyright striked because of all the music clips, but it's still there and you can watch it, so I will link it. Music is ultimately an arbitrary thing. And this is like, this is going to it sounds like a postmodernist claim that he's making you know this kind of thing about things being arbitrary but in this instance he knows what he's talking about he's, and he's right and his bad taste as far as like what is i don't know whatever taste is about snobbery really you know taste is something that allows elite people to uh criticize less sophisticated people it's subjective but that's how it ends up working. As far as the rules and things, though, there there are realities about music and the way that it affects us and the way that it works. And um, what but what happens is that it's always in relation to how it is perceived by our own ears, our own hearing. And what Jacob Collier has is beyond his singing abilities or his ability to play musical instruments. Those are all secondor secondary um, outcomes because of his primary gift, which is his ears, his hearing. He has ears to hear, and his ears to hear are probably beyond anyone else that is alive. Um, now, perfect pitch as it's kind of known, is a thing that probably a higher percentage, potentially everybody could learn. Because what it, what it really is, is it's understanding music and the musical scales as a form of language. So Rick Beato uh, has a great video where he talks about this because his son has perfect pitch. And basically, his son per developed this perfect pitch because his father was always playing extremely complex music around him all the time. And so just like a baby's brain learns how to decipher all the words and the patterns of words and speech and learn their native language, it, it, someone who's exposed to music of sufficient complexity can also decipher it basically because it's it's it works better with the more complex it is because you know if you only hear nursery rhymes you learn mary had a little lamb you you learn how that tune goes what you're really learning is the relationship with the notes you couldn't tell it if it was in the key of c or the key of g or the key of d but you recognize the relationship between the notes but someone with perfect pitch recognizes the notes themselves but this is probably a thing where there is also degrees to it, because what, what Jacob is saying, and this is true, is that there is an arbitrary nature to notes on a scale, music, sound, etc. Now, it's sound waves vibrating at certain frequencies, and 
there is um, a scale from one starting note to when that note will repeat again. So that's the octave. You go from a low C to a high C, you're back at the same note. But in between those two notes that resonate at the same frequency, there is an infinite number of ways that you could divide it up. The simplest way you could divide it up would be black and white, which is how we like to divide things. So this is also similar to the way you could think about light. Black would be darkness and musically it would be silence, whereas white light is the full spectrum of light. White noise is the full spectrum of all sound. Uh, it's all the frequencies of sound put together. So you either have black or white. That is the most basic uh, way you could divide it. Just to say sound or no sound. It's, it's really no sound or all sound. Or you could divide it um, into different segments. Now there are these naturally occurring um, harmonic resonances where you know if you were playing a note on a computer you're playing a pure sine wave you're only playing one particular sound but anytime you're playing that sound in real life like on a stringed instrument or you're singing it or playing it on a trumpet or a flute or whatever the the principal note will ring out the loudest but other frequencies will also be present those are the harmonic resonances, but they're, they're less so. Now, if you take those naturally occurring resonances, and amplify them to the same level as the primary note, then you get chords, you know, like uh, C-A-E uh, or C-E-A, you know, you get a C chord, whatever. Um, you've elevated those other notes. Now, the problem is, is that for every principal note, those frequencies don't, they, they resonate slightly different. So the A in a C chord, the, the A that complements the C is different from the A that complements, um, than like the pure A of an A chord. So basically you would have to tune every instrument to play one specific chord. To get around this, what people did is they invented uh, even-tempered tuning. So they take that the scale from one note to its repeating place, and they divide it equally into 12 spaces. Now all the notes are actually slightly out of tune with each other, as we call it, but it allows you to easily stack those notes together to make chords and melodies, whatever. Um, so that's Another, so that's two ways that are similar yet different. And if you play those two, a chord, even tempered C chord and a natural C chord together, you would actually hear dissonance because there, there's discrepancies between the two. Um, beyond that, we also have other ways that we measure sound, like the more scientific way is in hertz. And hertz is the number of times that a vibration occurs per second. So A is 440. So an A note, A440, that particular one, resonates 440 times per second. So, but what that's, you know, what that's doing is, uh, is breaking things up into hundreds and thousands. So, hertz and kilohertz. Um, but that is also an arbitrary uh, way to divide it. Now, most people with perfect pitch could probably tell you if it's what note on the 12 note scale, and they could tell you if it was sharp or flat. Um, Jacob Collier can hear all the things in between those notes, probably down to like the level of Hertz. And this is why when he says it's arbitrary or whatever, he knows what he's talking about because it's not his training, it's his ears. So when we listen to something like Bach, and we know Bach is very complex, we're very impressed by his layering of different harmon harmonies, counter melodies, all this stuff. 
uh, Jacob Collier can listen to that and he just hears everything that's going on right away. Same thing with like Rick Beato's kid. He kind of does demonstrations where he just takes, smashes hands down on the piano. You don't even have to look. The kid hears all the notes that have been hit and he can tell you what they all are. It's like auditory omniscience in a way. So when you get to that point, there, there's no more transcendent quality to music because the transcendent, or I should say in most music, the transcendent experience that we have when we listen to Bach or uh, Handel or something like that, it's more or less part of, of the fact that we don't understand everything exactly what's going on. There is a mystery to it as far as most normal people are concerned. And even if you learn it and study it, some of that mystery goes away. If it's difficult to execute, you can still take um, a lot of joy in that. But beyond that, it's, you know, if, if you hear all that stuff instantly, it, it turns everything into Mary Had a Little Lamb. There's no mystery left. But where the mystery lies is in the fact that in between any two points, there is not two on and off, black and white, nor is there 12, the notes of the regular scale, nor is there even thousands of hertz difference. There is actually an infinite amount between them. And we don't like bad singing because it doesn't conform to the frames that we're familiar with. Now, you know, some of this is, is, is easily verifiable to be subjective, because if you go to India, they have a different scale. They take those two notes that are the same and the space in between, they divide it up differently. And what Jacob Collier does, if you listen to that Moon River song, you'll hear him doing all these things where he's finding, he's making his own patterns in between. He's dividing the things up evenly to create sorts of harmonies, but they are not the ones that we are typically aware of. And so if he hears somebody doing bad singing, at a certain point, it's not bad singing anymore because it's actually somebody who's untrained singing in a particular way that is, it's far more complex than good singing because good good singing is all about getting it to fit into a, a pa package that we recognize. Um, so if the surprise and the wonder is going to come from the chaos. And ultimately, um, this is connected to another kind of thing I want to talk about. I'll, I'll do it. I plan to do a little bit more of a well-planned out thing, but you know, we talk about this thing of like combinatorial explosion um, and we'll talk about order out of chaos. Combinatorial explosion is a good explanation of how God views chaos. Chaos doesn't exist to God because he's infinite in his understanding, his hearing, his seeing. There is no chaos. There's no mystery to him. But what he enjoys, or what he can enjoy, is all the infinite possibilities of everything that lies between the nothing and the something, the black and the white. So, and I think that's the same way, the way that Jacob Collier is hearing it. Um, and, you know, you can even see, like, somebody like Vern Power, he has a great appreciation for uh, an understanding and appreciation of what is good music and all the things, but what he really, his, the things that excite him are this weird stuff that we haven't heard before. He, he's got all sorts of music that we don't listen to because the other stuff is mapped territory. You know, we talk about this kind of in the Peterson maps of meaning kind of way. The map territory is not exciting. What's exciting is what's on the edges, what's on the fringes, the unknown, the chaos. And so we almost don't even notice Jacob Collier doing the weird things he does because he knows how to do it and he knows how to do it in a way that more or less uh, com conforms to our normal understanding of what like good music is. 
what he's doing is he's kind of gently stretching our boundaries with his weird singing. And like I said, this is kind of like more evident in the fact of like, he's not necessarily picking songs that are good because of the lyrics or he's, he's doing stuff because it's so weird and, and difficult. He's not like the question of like, is this a good compelling song? It's, he's just, it's like, it's beyond that for her. He doesn't care because what he's getting it from is, is, is from his ears. It's from his ears. He has ears to hear, the way that some of us do not have ears to hear, nor do we have eyes to see. And so, a person who has eyes to see and ears to hear can uh, take joy in a lot of the things that are chaotic and confusing to others, because they can see that it's not ultimately as bad as it seems, nor is it um, as destructive, nor is it... Uh, necessarily ugly and so I think you know what he's doing is, is kind of showing the same way and I, and I think that this really is a glimpse into the way that God sees things and you know he, he we, because we we see problems and we don't know how to solve them he sees challenges that are fun and exciting to to solve more or less and you know I think we could probably understand that on the level of even just how our tastes and experiences change from being a child to being a grown-up. You know, kids' games aren't fun once you master them. You want to move on to more complex things. So um, that's my thoughts on this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something else about combinatorial explosion and uh, Romans 118 and psychedelics or something like that. But I'll have... I'll, do a little more thought and write it out first so it makes a little more sense. Thank you.